Hey, good morning, everyone. I hope you are doing all right. So it's time to move to new chapter. Hey, so, so far we have learned all the basic physics that we're going to be using in this course. I hope you remember those. Kinematics, laws of motions or dynamics and conservation principles. We learned two of them, conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. So now, from now on, we're gonna be using these four basic principles, plus of course, we have to always learn new vocabularies or definitions, right? So we're gonna be learning those things or using, I, I should say, we're going to be using those things in different kind of motions. So today's, or for example, this, this week, or even uh, next week, we're going to be talking about motion of, let's see, what kind of motion? Rotational motion, okay? So we have a circular motion where object, a point object that went around, you know, in horizontal circle, or vertical circle, right? So now, what we're gonna be talking about is, so in that case, the object we assumed was point object. So now it's gonna be extended object, not point object. So that means to draw a free body diagram, you have to draw a line rather than a dot for an object. So that means what happens? When object is rotating something like that, different points are moving with different speed and so on, okay? So those kind of description we're gonna be using, but we'll be using those same four or three basic principles, okay? And we will use all of them actually in this rotational motion of an object. So it's gonna be also kind of review because our Second midterm is coming soon. So, rotational motion. So, for example, when I'm spinning this object, right, or when you are opening the door or shutting the door, or you are spinning yourself, right, there can be several examples. So, let's first start by opening a door. Okay, so door is just a wooden rectangular object, right? So it has hinges, so that one attaches on the wall, right? And there is a knob. Oh. And there is that knob. So now, and by the way, there is no sound in this video, so you're not going to be listening. And again, this video was taken from this Flipping Physics a channel on the YouTube. Probably I already talked about it. You know, this person has done really good job producing these videos, okay? Has put a lot of work in it. And it, I have also linked this on the homepage of our class, like uh, some useful YouTube channels, okay? So that's how I have linked it. So anyway, so that's where this video is from. So there is there is in somewhere and there is knob, okay? So this person is trying to open this door, okay? So now when something rotates, we are, you know, we have to uh, pay attention about what point this object is rotating or line the object is rotating. So that is called axis of rotation. So where is axis of rotation here? And uh, this knob is farthest, practically farthest possible place from the hinges of this door. So why is that, okay? So those are the kind of thing you wanna keep in mind while watching this video. It's a sort, okay? So let's run it. Again, this person is trying to open this and uh, looks like just got up from the bed and trying to find it, so finds it, okay? So 
that one is uh, that far from the hinges, okay? And the line passing through the hinges, vertical line in this case passing through the hinges, is the axis of rotation. So it's easy to rotate. But if you try closer to the hinge, so that you need to apply large force, okay? So it's not just the force, but where you apply force matters. That's what this example is showing you, okay? So, so far, when we talked about motion, for example, Newton's laws, it was force. Where you apply force did not matter because we assume the object is a point object. So there is no distance from the point, right? So that was the situation. So now what we have is this, like uh, object is now extended and where you apply force matters. So how far from the axis of rotation you are applying the force matters and that distance is denoted by lowercase r, okay? r matters. That's what this video is showing us. And then now there is part of the, you know, it is another clip of the same video here. So now this person is trying to rotate this door, but pushing directly towards the hinge. Okay, pushing directly towards the hinge. So before pushed something like that, okay. So it was perpendicular, this person was pushing perpendicular to the door surface, right? Now the person is pushing parallel to the door surface, okay? So when you push like that, can you rotate this door, even if you are applying relatively large force? So let's watch this. See, the door is not rotating. So there is axis of rotation and force is being applied directly towards the axis of rotation. That's what this is, sketch is showing, okay? And that is R where the force is being applied. Okay, so what it means? It means direction matters, okay? What direction you apply force matters. So that's what this example is. So it's not just the force for the rotational motion, okay? How far the force is from axis of rotation and what's the angle the force is being applied, okay? So for rotational motion, it's the package of three things, force itself, of course, without force you cannot rotate it, but also, how far the force is from axis of rotation, R, and at what angle? Let's say the angle is theta. So force, distance, and angle. So we put together an equation. Basically, you know, including all these. So for rotational motion, this pack is, whole pack is matters. And that package is called torque, okay? And this is Greek alphabet. It's a tau, it's called tau, okay? It's not a T, it's a tau, Greek alphabet. So the torque is combination of these three, okay? So probably if you remember, we talked about work done. Work done was also product of three things. Force, displacement, okay, like R, okay? How far it is, and cosine of angle between them. See, the difference is just cosine versus sine, okay? Here we multiplied force and displacement, both vectors, but we got a scalar. So this kind of product of vector is called scalar product. So same equation can also be written something like this. You may have seen it. 
sometimes written like that. But when you open this and write all in terms of just values, that's when it becomes this. And we paid attention to the angle to take account of the direction, okay? Similarly, here we are writing product of R and F. The torque is not a scalar, it is a vector. So what's happening here? The vector R is being multiplied by vector F. So two vectors we are multiplying and getting a new vector. So that's the difference between that product and this product, okay? So this R F sine theta is also written as R times F, both vectors. See there, see this is dot over there. This dot is called a scalar product because the product of two vectors giving us a scalar quantity. We don't need to worry about direction for the work, okay? This many joule, left, right. We don't need to say left or right, just this many joules, okay? When we say how much work is being done. But for this one over here, what happens? This is torque. What direction is the torque? Like a force, okay? It's a vector. So this is, we are multiplying two vectors and getting new vectors. So this product is called vector product. So there are two kinds of products in vector quantity. So it's not like just multiplying numbers, okay? And here the sine theta comes from by just making the just the numbers, okay? Or the just multiplying the value. So R and F, they are just value. And reduction is taken care by the sine theta. So that means we have to be very careful about what angle we are using. Just like we were very careful about this thingy over there, what angle to use. And we said it's always angle between force and displacement. Similarly, over here, sine theta, this theta is always angle between R and F, okay? So if you want to use this formula like this, this theta has to be always angle between R and F, okay? So keep that in mind. So let me clean this a little bit. So over here, what do you see is there is a, you know, like looks like uh, this tire needs to be changed for some reason or repaired. So for that, it needs to be taken off. So for that, you need to loosen this knobs, right? So for that, this person is using this wrench. And the name of this wrench is not just wrench, it's called torque wrench. Why? Because it can produce larger torque than usual wrench. So that's the reason, okay? So why it can produce larger torque? See, for given angle and the force a person can apply, see, longer the length or farther you apply from axis of rotation, farther, force, farther the force you apply from axis of rotation, so that means larger the R, larger the torque. So that's why these longer range are called torque range because it can produce larger torque, okay? So here, let's say this portion is applying force something like this. So R is from axis of rotation to the point of application of force, okay? So that's called axis of rotation point about which or the line about which something rotates. So in this case, the knob rotating about this axis over there. So this line or passing through the center of that knob is called the axis of rotation, okay? So Now, what is the angle? We said angle is the angle between R and F. So R here is pointing, you know, it starts from the axis of rotation and it goes towards the force. So that is the R. 
So when we say angle between R and F, we need to look at this angle here. That's the angle between R and F. Okay, so that's the angle between R and F. So that's what I'm showing you there, okay? So that is the angle between R and F. So if any other angle is given, this formula may not work. So you need to modify that because if this formula works, when this angle theta is the angle between R and F. So if you are given this angle, then this is not going to be R and F. Angle between R and F means this is not going to work. So how do we do it? So there are different ways we can find torque. Okay. So anyway, if you know angle between R and F, then you can multiply these three things and you get torque due to that force. Okay, and it turns out that if you have angle given that's between this R here and F, although it's from this side, the result is going to be same. Although the angle is not going to be same, it turns out the, because of the property of the sine function. So even if you know this angle, then you can plug that in over there and you get the answer. Okay, because sine, so if this is theta, this is going to be 180 minus theta, and sine of 180 minus theta is again sine theta. So that's why either way it works. Okay, so this is going to be 180 minus theta. So which is going to be same as sine theta. So either from this side or that side, you can use that uh, this formula. Okay. Otherwise, you cannot use sine theta. So what do you do? Of course, we'll learn how to find torque using different methods. So this is one method. Okay. And by the way, the formal name of this one is the R is position vector. So it is position of force from the axis of rotation. So that's why it is also called position vector. That is formal name. Okay. So just like I emphasize over there, I'm just emphasizing the same thing in this slide here, okay? So when you are using this formula, the angle has to be either this one, and by the way, there is this R. See here, this, this is the R for this door. So that is R I am drawing. So now, to draw a free body diagram, you are drawing line, not a point. So that's the difference we need to use because distance matters so we cannot just replace object by a dot and then angle is measured from radial line to the direction of force so either this one so this is the formal or proper angle but this is also works okay this is proper as goes in the definition, but this one also works. I just talked about that, right, in the last slide. But let's say sometimes you may be given an angle like this. So this angle is not angle between force and R, okay? So this angle, for example, alpha, let's say, if I give say that is alpha, some different notation than theta, let's say. So that is not or I may just write this as a theta. So if that's the case, then this theta directly does not go in that equation. It, that's not gonna give you torque, okay? It's gonna be different value. So keep that in mind. So if this angle is known, given, then what do we do? Or let's say any angle other than this or that is given, what do we do? So we're gonna learn some common methods here uh, you can use in any situations. So first, uh, so there are three things, R, F, and theta 
combined with sine. Okay, theta itself doesn't have much meaning in the equation unless you have sine cosine tangent. Okay, so what we're gonna do is uh, now if we look at f and sine theta together, see here, if we look at this together, it looks like a component of a force. So for example, let's say we have a force and if we find component of it, hopefully you remember that. So there is theta. Then we can write component of this force in, let's say x and y direction. So this is f cosine theta because this is adjacent. And uh, this also can be drawn over here is f sine theta because this is opposite, right? So opposite picks the sine and adjacent picks the cosine. <coughs> Excuse me. So similarly, we can think of this as a component of this force that's being applied to rotate the object, okay? So that's what I'm looking at here, okay? So there is this force. So now let's think in terms of component, okay? F sine theta is a component. Rather than different entity, let's look at this as a component of this force. So if I were to find component for this given angle theta, and remember the angle is always this in this formula. Angle is this between R and F. So in this case, what happens? Which one is the F sine theta? So just like we did here, we, the, the angle was with respect to X in this case. Similarly, here we already have R. So rather than writing X, we use this as a axis radial axis. We call that radial axis. Okay, So one axis is radial axis. Another one is perpendicular to that, just like x. And then y is perpendicular to x. Similarly, there is this radial axis, r, and another one going to be perpendicular to that. So if we find these components, what do we do? What do we get? So, for example, let's say if I were to draw properly, uh, let's see if I have drawn that. So, oh, I am just drawing the perpendicular here. So, let's write the component of this. This angle is known, so we go this way first, and then we come this way, right? So, this is radial component. It is adjacent to the angle. So that means it picks cosine, so this becomes f cosine theta. Now, this is the opposite of angle, so opposite from theta, so that means picks sine, means it's going to be f sine theta. But we can also draw this one from this point where the, you know, force and this radial axis are meeting, okay? So we can do that. So it's like we are moving this one there. So we can write that F sine theta. And this is perpendicular to the radial. So that's why in here I'm writing F sine theta, sorry, that component as a perpendicular component, okay? So two lines going like that, that we call parallel, right? And one line, another line making 90 degree, we call that perpendicular. So that's why sometimes the notation is written something like this, okay? So this perpendicular component becomes the F sine theta. So here this F sine theta can be replaced by perpendicular component, okay? So this can be written as this, but remember, this is not whole force. It is a component of force. Which component? Perpendicular component. And when force is perpendicular on its own, so for example, let's say we are applying force perpendicular, that means it's 90 degree, then whole thing is perpendicular component. 
So in that case, what happens? This can also be written as simply R times F when F is perpendicular to So this is the easiest situation where you can, you know, find the torque. When is it easiest? When force is exactly perpendicular to the radius, okay? So let's say radial vector. R is that and F is that. So angle between them, theta is 90 degree. So that means perpendicular. So what's the torque? It is just R times F. Why? because sine 90 degree is one. Oh, so that reminds me, maybe you wanna keep this couple of things handy. Remember, for finding work done, we wrote some of these cosine values of different angle. Cosine zero, we said was positive one. Cosine 90 degree was uh, zero. And cosine 180 degree, we said was negative one. Similarly, sine zero degree, so it's kind of opposite. Sine zero degree is zero, okay? And sine 90 degree is one. So that's why the angle, when angle is 90 degree, the sine 90 degree, so this, this becomes one. So that means you can just write R times F. Okay, it basically comes from here. And sine 180 degree is negative one. Oh, not negative one, my bad, zero. So there are numbers between these other than zero and one, of course, okay? But when torque is zero, when sine zero degree, so when theta is zero degree, that means, what does that mean? So for example, here, let's draw a force in zero degree. So R is here. So if we wanna draw force at zero degree with that R, then we need to draw a force right there, for parallel, right? So when they are parallel, that's a zero degree. So that means R and theta, sorry, R and F both should be pointing in same direction. So that is a special case. So, so it's like a, you put that wrench and then that you pulling the wrench straight along the length of the wrench. Of course, it's not gonna turn. So that's why torque is zero, okay? And another situation, you apply force opposite. So you push inward, right? So R is this way and F is this way. So what's the angle between them? That is 180 degree. So if you just push like this the, on the example of door opening, right? So the person was pushing directly into the radius or to the door, right? Uh, so that means that angle was 180 degrees. So that's why the torque was zero. And similarly, pull the door and then pull directly towards you away from the axis of rotation, right? Along the length. The, the, the width of the door, yeah, I have something here. So usually what do we do? We push like that to open the door. So if I'm pushing like this, that is 90 degree I'm making with this, right? But rather than doing that, if I were to just push directly inward, okay, directly inward, so that means angle is 180 degrees, so torque is zero, so that's why this doesn't, rotate, right? And similarly, if you pull directly outward in that direction, so here I am pulling, so it won't rotate when I pull. So in that case, angle is zero degree, okay? So when that's the case, torque is zero, no matter how big the force you apply, okay? So that's what that equation is saying. So uh, these, uh, some of these values are gonna come out handy. Okay. okay, so this is second way of finding torque. Use all formula if you know angle between R and F. Sometimes it's easy to talk in terms of components. 
So you can write R times perpendicular component of force. So over here we grouped these two together, but R is also a vector. So that means we can also group R and sine theta. And that's what we're going to do next. Oh, before we do that, I am pausing here to get your feedback on components, okay? So here there is R, there is F, this angle is given, and I am saying that angle is alpha. This is alpha, name of that angle. So now, if you want to use this formula, you need to use perpendicular component of force, okay? So that means, what is the perpendicular component of force in this case? So that's what I'm asking you, okay? So, the angle is on this side, so you can go this way and that way. So this becomes parallel component. So alpha is here, parallel, and this is perpendicular, right? So this is perpendicular, and this one is parallel. So I'm asking what is the perpendicular component of this. So parallel, this can also be drawn here. Usually that's what we do, right? So here, what is the component? So if you know how to write component, you can write the torque because torque gonna be just R times that component, okay? So I'm opening the pool. With all these, I think one, one minute and 30 seconds would be good enough for you to answer this question. So I'll get rid of these to let you see clearly. I'm 30 more seconds. Five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and it stops. Let's see what we got. So we got sine. Sine was right there, right? So of course it would be sine. But remember that sine is when this angle is either that one or that one. Oh that one but the given angle is not that so it is like a finding component of this vector looks like many of you forgot how to do that so f is there the angle alpha is there means what is this component this is the adjacent one so that means it picks the cosine folks okay so a is correct answer not b okay So that means what is torque then? Torque in this case, see if I use this formula, it's going to be R F cosine alpha. So now you may be thinking, hey, it was sine. Now how come it became cosine? Because the angle is different. So it could be cosine. Okay. Remember, 
sine only if we know this angle or that angle, angle between R and F. The angle this, this angle wasn't between R and F, okay? So we have to pay attention. I'm, I'm glad I brought this question. So hopefully now you remember, you paid attention, okay? So now, just like I was showing, saying we can pair this R and sine theta. So it's like component of R. So which component, okay? So how do we find that? So that's what we're gonna be learning here, okay? So same situation. So now for this, you need to, and this is, this is the method we're gonna be using most of the time to find torque, okay? This is the method we're gonna be using. So it involves like two or three steps, okay? Two or three steps. So keep that in mind because this can be applied in any kind of situation, no matter what angle is given and so on, okay? We can do this, apply this. So when we pair that, we call this lever arm, okay? So that we call lever arm. So how do we draw that? So first step is line of action of force. So this force is already shown here. So you just draw a line passing through that force, okay? So there is some R and there is, let's say F. How do you draw a line of action of force? Just make this longer. You don't need to put new arrows, just a longer line, okay? No matter how it is, okay? There, there. How do you draw line of action of force? Just make this longer. Okay, just make it longer. That's it. So that's step one. And the second step where we actually draw the, the R sine theta. Okay, so how do we do it? We draw a line starting from axis of rotation so that's why always level where the axis is when you are doing this kind of problem, okay? Axis matters a lot. So from axis of rotation to the this line of action of force, or in short, this is also called line of force, L-O-F, line of force, okay? Force line, line of force, line of action of force. And then now you draw a line starting from axis of rotation to the line of action of force or line of force. But you can draw several such lines. So which one are we talking about? The one that is shortest, okay? The one that is shortest. So which one is shortest? Among the drawn one looks like that is the shortest one, okay? So how do I know exactly it is shortest? The shortest one makes 90 degree, okay? So by doing that, we are making a right triangle here. You see that? We are making a right triangle. So that's what we are doing. So I think I have drawn it here in PowerPoint. So I'm gonna just show you that. So that is labor arm. It's the shortest line drawn from axis of rotation to the line of action of force, okay? From axis of rotation to the line of action of force. So depending on how the force is, it may go this way or this way, okay? It has to be shortest one. So this is called lever arm. So why this is R sine theta then? So let's try to figure that out. So see, there are these two lines intersecting. So this angle is angle between this line R and F. So if I go inside the triangle now, I see this angle and that angle is same. So I can say, okay, that is theta, okay? Same as this, same. Because from geometry construction, we know this angle and that angle, they are same. This angle, that angle, they are same, okay? The opposite angles in the vortex, right? 
So this is theta. So now we have this R here as a hypotenuse by drawing by construction, this R always gonna be hypotenuse. And then now this is now opposite to this angle, right? So opposite to theta. So being opposite picks sine. So this is gonna be R sine theta. So length of this line is R sine theta. So that is called labor arm. So that's what I'm doing here, okay? So now if we write something like that, then torque is simply labor arm times force. So you figure out what the labor arm is and multiply that by force, you have torque. So knowing how to find labor arm in different kind of situation is important, okay? How the force is acting. Why it's important? Because it's more general. You can use this technique in any situation. So that's what we're gonna be practicing, okay? Once you have that, we are just like we saw, see if this angle is known, this is R sine theta. But rather than this angle, if this angle is known, let's say, then this would be, see this same thing would be R cosine alpha if this angle was known, because that would be adjacent. So depending on what angle is known, it could be sine or cosine. So torque equation can have sine or cosine. So it's a sine only when the angle is the angle between R and F, okay? So with that said, here is a question for you. Okay, so here I'm asking for just lever arm, not the torque, okay? So force is there, R is there, and the angle is given here, it makes with horizontal, okay? So copy this in your paper or your device, copy this, this drawing. And I'm gonna go to the previous slide so that you can use that method to draw here, okay? If you don't remember. So did you copy this? So I'm gonna go to the previous slide, okay? Where it tells you how to draw liver arm, okay? So it, whenever you get confused on how to draw liver arm, here is the slide. And of course, I also talk about this in my posted notes, okay? So go ahead and draw a liver arm. So once I open the poll, there will be only 30 seconds to answer this question. So once you have right triangle, you, you have to have either this angle or that angle. That way you can find what component is this. So that's the main thing you are doing, okay? Okay, you hope you had a chance to do it. So now I'm opening the pool and you have 30 seconds. And five more seconds, five, four, three, two, one, and it stops, okay? So let's see what we got here, mostly C. Of course, it's R sine theta always, right? 
Oh. Looks like I have to end this show. So let's see. So in this case, we are looking for just lever arm. Okay. So we don't need torque. So torque is L times F, right? So without force is the lever arm. So this is lever arm. Lever arm is a distance. So there's not going to be force on that. So anything that has force in it, that's incorrect. Okay. And now let's figure out the lever arm. So step one, draw a line of action of force. Make this longer. This is step one. Step two, now that's where you draw the line of action, sorry, the that's where you draw the uh, lever arm, okay? So you start from axis of rotation and go to the line of action of force so that is shortest. So this is going to be shortest. How do I know? This angle is 90 degree. So now by doing this, I made a right triangle. And this is now hypotenuse, okay? And this is so the angle here, angle is here. So that means this side of this right triangle, this is adjacent. Fix cosine means the lever arm going to be R, of course, itself. And in this case, this being adjacent, it picks the cosine and the given angle is theta, so that's that, okay? So D is the correct answer. So quite a few of you made mistake here and this is important. So anything you like to ask or add here, just in case something is not clear. Okay, so I don't hear anything. So let's go to the next question. So this time you are finding torque. And to find torque, you need lever arm, right? So lever arm times torque. Or we learned three different methods. So you can use either one of those. So I'm opening the pool. Thirty more seconds.
in five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and it starts. Okay. So let's see how did we do here. So mostly C in this case, and there is E as well. So there is confusion between sine and cosine. So this time it is sine because it's the angle is angle between R and F. So this is the correct angle that goes in the formula with sine. Okay. So that's why this is that. Or we can also use other methods. For example, let's find the component perpendicular component here. F perpendicular. What would be that? Right? So in that case, it's like uh, drawing this way and then going that way. So that is perpendicular component. So this is opposite fix sine. That means it's going to be F sine theta. So that's going to be the perpendicular component of force. So F perpendicular in this case is F sine theta. So that's why torque is R F perpendicular means R F sine theta. So this is second method we learned. And third method is by drawing lever arm. And I want you to master that, okay? So let's use the third method. So for that, in step one, what do we do? We make this longer, okay? This is step one, line of force. Right, and second step, you draw the shortest line from axis of rotation to the line of action of force. Looks like that's going to make ninety degree here. So this is lever arm. So opposite to angle theta. So, fix sine. Okay, so that means it's going to be R sine theta, which we call that lever arm. So, torque, third method is lever arm times force. So, lever arm is R sine theta, and force is force, means it is RF sine theta. So no matter what method you do, you get the same, same answer as you should, okay? As long as you are doing it correctly. So I have another question. It's kind of a bit practical one. So suppose you are riding on a bike like this, okay? And then what happens? You are, the, what is rotating here? The pedal is, you know, that arm of the pedal is rotating, right? It's rotating. So this is axis of rotation. Here in the bike, the axis is about that axle over there, okay? So that is axis and about which this pedal over here, I mean, this, this thing here, is rotating. So it can be at different places, right? So when it is all the way at the top, so that is this. When it is somewhere between top and this horizontal one, just like we have here, that is C there, right? And when it is totally horizontal, means it's like that, that is what I am saying. This is choice B, okay? And when it goes all the way down, right? All the way down, that is A. So all the way up is D, all the way down is A. So that's what it is saying, top and bottom, okay? And these are in between one that is, this is horizontal, okay? So now, 
here is the question. Where do you get maximum torque? So torque is maximum when lever arm is longest. So can you figure out in what situation lever arm is the longest, right? So wherever the torque is maximum, highest torque, that's when you want to apply force, okay? Uh, other places you want to just relax while riding bike and uh, let's say competing or something like that, trying to be fast. So I'm opening this and you have two minutes to answer this question. Thirty more seconds. And five more seconds. Five, four, three, two. One and it stops. Okay, so let's see what we got here. So we got all of them. So a bit more for B, and there is C and D. Okay, so just like I have suggested, to find the lever arm, we need to first figure out what direction force is acting. So when we are pushing pedal, or turns out we push pedal down all the time, not just when it is here but also oh, why this keeps doing that so even when it is there it's it's vertically down So that is the direction at which force is acting and the axis is there, okay? So now, what is torque due to this force? So it's like pushing the door directly to the hinge, okay? So that's how it looks like, right? So if you just push from the top, what happens? Your torque is zero over there, not the maximum one. Why? Because force is this way, and R is that way, so angle between them is 180 degree, or in terms of lever arm, so this line of force passes through the axis. So line of action of force is passing through the axis, means the lever arm is zero, okay? So in terms of lever arm, lever arm is zero, means torque is zero. In terms of angle, angle is 180 degree. So that means if you think in terms of that, that is also sine 180 is zero, so that is zero, okay? And same thing is true for A as well at the bottom, okay? So what happens? Force is here, 
So R is coming this way. So that means the force and the R, both of them are pointing in same direction, means angle is zero degree, means torque is zero. Another way round in terms of labor arm. So if I were to draw a line of force, this line of force passes through the axis of rotation. So whenever line of ax line of force, when you push or pull directly towards or away from the axis, what happens? It's not gonna rotate because torque is zero, just like pushing or pulling a door. Okay. So that means labor arm is zero for this one as well. Now remaining these two. So that means zero means they're not gonna give highest. So D and A disqualify for the answer con consideration. So now for these two, see, we don't know exact, oh, in this case, there is 90 degrees. So you can say, okay, it is R times F, R being this, right? So torque is R times F. But how about this one here, right? So in terms of lever arm, if you think in terms of lever arm, this lever arm and R, they're gonna be equal here for this case, okay? Now, but for this one here, if I draw like that, see the shortest distance is just that. The lever arm for that one is less than this R thingy here. So a smaller labor arm for C means the torque at that point is smaller compared to this. So that's so the B is the position at which you get the largest torque. Okay. So that's why that's where you want to apply the maximum force when you are riding a bike and trying to get fastest possible. And of course, the opposite side is also true. So left foot versus right foot. So that's when you want to apply the maximum force when this pedal handle, the pedal is here, handle is this, right? So when pedal handle is horizontal. Pedal is always horizontal, so that's why the force you apply is vertical all the time. Pedal is always horizontal. That's how they are. It is mounted, but the pedal handle so this is pedal handle, right? Pedal is not shown here. I took the pedal out, for example, okay? So B is correct answer in this case. Oh, it is 11.05 break time, I guess. So let's take break. So I'll see you in five minutes. Okay, folks, so welcome back. So I got question on the Zoom, and because of that, I drew these two extra thing in here to help to explain. So what happens is, in case of C, the force is still vertically down. So because of that, the lever arm becomes shorter, okay, compared to B. If the force we were applying was something like this, then this would be lever arm and the torque would be equal. So it turns out when we ride bicycle, we don't push the pedal sideways, but rather we always push downward. So because of that, this lever arm due to this, over here I'm drawing, okay, so this is R and force is vertically down means this is lever arm, this is axis. So this lever arm here is shorter than the lever arm of this one here when it is totally horizontal. So larger lever arm means larger torque because torque is lever arm times force, assuming force is same. Hopefully that helped. So now moving to another question. So forces are shown here in this case, so it should be easier than the previous question, right? So force is given, so think in terms of lever arm again. In what situations lever arm the longer or shorter? So longer lever arm makes larger torque, means that's going to be most effective to turn the knob, okay?
You have two minutes for this one. Thirty more seconds. Five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and it starts. So new worksheet is, a, you know, first question on the new worksheet is about using these three different methods to find the torque, okay? So this is not yet linked on the assignment, uh, you know, the page. Uh, because our last is not due yet. So sometimes it didn't upload in the wrong slot, so I try to avoid that. But the new worksheet is already posted inside the posted inside the worksheet folder. Worksheet and feedback folder, I think. Okay, so it's already there. And let's see if I can. Oh, looks like. So it is Worksheet 9, and this is how it looks like. So it is asking you to find torque due to the same force, is it? Or did three different situations looks like? And A and B is the same, you know, like a diagram. So it's asking you to find using two different methods, first by finding the perpendicular component, just like we did in one of the clicker question, and B is by drawing the lever arm. So we want, I want that to see in details so that you show your own standing, you know how to draw it. So, okay, so it's a practice of drawing lever arm and I want that detail here. And this is another one where the angle is 90 degree. And by the way, this looks like one, but it is L, the distance of the door handle from the hinge. And this is L, not a one, okay? So question number two, we'll cover this in most likely next class, okay? So you'll be ready to do this worksheet. First question after today's class, actually after now, you, you know, we covered that. 
And for question two, we'll do some problem similar to that in next class, okay? So there is new worksheet, folks. So now this one, let's see how did we do here. So we have B slightly more than D and E. D and E are competing, okay? So all of them, B, D, and E, all of them have one thing common, which has two, the largest, okay? So two is the largest, and which is correct. So the force is going like that, means shortest distance from axis of rotation to the, it's gonna be this, so this is gonna be its lever arm, okay? So this is, let's say, L2. So force is same, so that means the larger torque arises whenever lever arm is larger, okay? So now going back to one, this is line of force. So lever arm gonna be straight that, okay? So this is L1. And now for the three, what happens? Line of force goes like that means the lever arm is this, which is L3. And for this one, the force is going like that. So that means labor arm is just that. So this is L4. So it looks like L1 and L4, they have same length. So same value of labor arm means torque is same. So one and four, torque is same. So out of these three, the only one that has one and four equal. And of course, two is largest. And the L3, this is shortest one because this length is shorter than this or that length, okay? Because it's, see, this, this hole would be that. But here, this is the lever arm because lever arm is the shortest distance from axis of rotation to the line of force. So that's why it is very important that you keep that in your head, okay? So these, so that means E is the correct answer in this case, okay? Anything you like to add or ask on this one here? Okay, then let's move on. So we learn how to find value of the torque. So torque is a vector. That means it has both value and direction. So we learn about value. Now let's learn about direction, how to find direction, how to write direction. So usually we're gonna be writing this torque in, for example, Newton's laws, like net torque. So you need to add torques. So when you are adding torques in equation, how do you include, how do you include the direction? You assign sign for the direction, right? So that's what we are learning here in this slide. How do you assign the sign of a torque? The sign represents the direction, okay? So we can have positive or negative sign. So often we said, okay, if up is positive, force is positive, and if that is positive, this is gonna be negative, right? So those are the kind of thing we said for the force. So force, when you apply force on a point object, what happens? It moves object from one point to another point. We call that translational motion. So that's the kind of motion we are talking about before today's class. But today, what happens? Force has this tendency of rotating object, okay? Force has tendency of rotating. So rotation can be talked in terms of clockwise or counterclockwise. Hopefully you learn clockwise, counterclockwise thing and clock handle, clock with hands, right? <laughs> when you are at a school, these days it's hard to find a clock with the hands. 
So maybe hard to figure out which one is clockwise, which one is counterclockwise, huh? So that's what we're going to be using. So for example, here, there is an axis. So pointing out leveling axis for rotational motion is very important. Keep that in mind. And let's say this force is acting something like this. So now the axis is here. If I So this is the point about which this object turns, OK? So my hand here, if I apply force upward here, what happens? It goes like that, OK? There is this. So axis is here. When I apply force like this, it goes like that. Similarly, you can say, OK, since the force is acting this way, it goes like that. And is it clockwise or counterclockwise? Oh, looks like I just wrote there. It's right there, right? So this is clockwise rotation. So when a torque is rotating or trying to rotate an object in clockwise direction, then sign of that torque we use you know, the clockwise, we use that as a negative, okay? We assign negative for that. And then let's say there is another force acting on this. Oops. It's pointing downward and the axis is still there, means it has a tendency of rotating this way. That means this is going to be counterclockwise. And by the way, the clockwise in sword is also written as a CW, counterclockwise. When that's the case, then it is positive. Okay? So now what happens? With the value and proper sign, now you can keep adding those. So for example, if torque due to this force, let's say F1, F2, if the torque due to this one was torque 1 and torque due to this one was torque 2, then now you can find net torque, which is torque 1 and torque 2. But these are vector, so we need to write them with proper sign. So since torque 1 is trying to rotate clockwise, this is going to be negative torque 1. And torque 2 is trying to rotate counterclockwise, means that would be positive, right? So that's how you can add the torques. Okay? So once you have that, you have net torque. And what do we know? When net torque is zero, object is in rotational equilibrium. Just like uh, when net force is when net force is zero, we say object is in equilibrium. So maybe now we need to be more specific. This kind of motion is called translational. If we are differentiating between rotational and translational, so it is translational equilibrium. This is rotational equilibrium. So if object is not moving from one place to another place and not spinning as well, that means it is in full equilibrium. That's called static equilibrium. We'll talk about that soon as well. But for now, that. But if network is not zero, oops, not zero, then what happens? Net torque must be equal to I times alpha. Just like sum of force is mass times acceleration. Here, this. So this is not mass, but related to mass because 
how easy or difficult for an ob you know to rotate an object depends not just on the mass but where we are applying force as well okay so for example i have this you know it's not that heavy but let's say if this was a heavy object then rotating this about the center would be easier than you know holding on the side and lifting it okay holding on the side and lifting more difficult than holding here and lifting it okay so why that's the case again at what distance the force is acting matters it's not just the mass mass of that object is same right but where you are applying force matters so to take account of that we have now this is called rotational inertia also called moment of inertia sometimes okay oh not inertial but inertia so this mass is inertia because it tells us how easy or difficult to give the acceleration mass determines right so large mass accelerate that requires larger force so inertia is tendency of not changing its state if object at rest remember the object at rest wants to remain at rest an object in motion wants to remain in motion that property of not changing the state resistance to the change to the state is called inertia okay so the inertia for translational motion is determined by mass but inertia for the rotational motion is determined by mass and how far the force is acting so for now i'm just writing that and this is uppercase i and this is angular acceleration okay this is angular acceleration just like this is translational or just linear acceleration okay so those are the things i have written there so now to make sure that we learn how to assign the sign for the torques here is this exercise okay so now see the axis is here pay always pay attention to the axis otherwise your answer may be wrong okay so the one force is like that it's acting at this much degree so what you are doing is you are just looking at what is the tendency of this force rotating this object so uh, uh, is this force trying to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise you assign the sign based on that clockwise negative counterclockwise positive so that's the convention we use so you first examine whether it's trying to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise and based on that you assign the sign so now with that said i'm going to open the poll and you have a minute and 30 seconds to answer this question Thirty more seconds.
and five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and it stops. Okay, let's see what we got here. Oh, we got all of them. C got a little bit more than the others. Let's see how it works. So axis is here. So when we apply force like this, it has a tendency of rotating that way. Okay, it's pulling kind of up, right? So that means it's trying to rotate this way. So that is called clockwise. So negative sign for that, okay, for F. And then F1, so the axis is here. It is also trying to rotate this way. So that is clockwise, okay? So that means this is also negative. However, F2 is on the other side of the axis. So it is, it's going to try to rotate that way. So that means it's positive. So since it says F, F1, and F2, sign of those, so it looks like we're going to have negative, negative, and positive. So negative, negative, and positive. So D is correct answer in this case. So a lot of mistake again. So maybe I'll show you a trick, and I'm hoping you know clock what clockwise and what counterclockwise means. So I'm going to stop sharing this slide, and uh, that's going to make this video a little bit bigger so that you can see what I'm showing. So over here. So wherever it says axis, you want to hold. So we always have pen or pencil in our hand when we are doing physics. At least I am hoping so, right? And uh, wherever it says axis, you hold it there, okay? So for example, in this case, the axis is somewhere like this. And then F, well, now I need to erase this to so make it visible. Oh, <laughs> I'm not sharing it, so you cannot see my slide. So when you apply force this way, so try applying force the way the, you know, the diagram is saying. So in this case, force is acting that way, means it's trying to rotate this way. Now, is that clockwise or counterclockwise? You determine, and if it is clockwise, it's a negative, right? Now, similarly, the F1 is acting somewhere here, so it is also trying to rotate same way, okay? If the forces are on the same side of the axis and acting in same direction, both of them are trying to rotate in the same direction. So the sign of the torque gonna be same, okay? But now, here, what happens? If you go opposite direction, although the force is acting up, what happens? It is now trying to rotate in opposite direction of what it was doing on the other side. So forces on the opposite side has effect of rotating in opposite direction. So that's why in a seesaw, when a kid sits here, it's trying to rotate this way, right? But when another kid sits, see the force is acting downward, so it's trying to rotate that way. So they can both, one is trying to rotate clockwise, another one is trying to rotate counterclockwise, means you can have balance. Clockwise rotation can cancel counterclockwise rotation. Positive can cancel negative number if they are equal, okay? So that's what, so that's how you want to do it. Actually hold the object where it says the axis and try applying force so you can see it on your own. So it does not have to be difficult, okay? So with that, uh, did I choose the answer here? Looks like I did. So now here is again about the value, okay? So, oh, I need to share the, slide. Okay. So now in this question, see what's happening. Axis is there. So this is actually R. And there is this ankle weight. So weight always acts vertically down. So the force is there. Okay. So what's the torque due to this force? 
is talking about. So force is shown. What's the torque due to that force? So in this case, the force is, let's say, F is the force, right? So even if we just lift our hand or leg of force, what happens? Not so easy, right? But if we put a weight here, weight over there, what happens? Lifting this gets more difficult because now torque becomes larger and we don't put this ankle weight right near the axis. We put it farthest practically possible place to make this R larger means torque gonna be larger, right? So that's how you make your muscle stronger by applying the torque. And that's what this exercise is about. But now question here is, how much is the torque due to this ankle weight? Okay. So now with that said, so this number, I'm just doing calculation here. If you can identify correct formula or not, you don't have to do the number for this particular question here. All you have to do is which formula to use correctly or just multiply that or none of those, okay? So, yes, although it's, it has a number, number of things I have taken care of, all you have to do is physics, okay? So I'm opening the poll and you have a minute and 30 seconds from here. Thirty more seconds. And five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one and it stops okay let's see what we got yeah the sine theta never gonna leave it right so theta here is this so theta is 30 degree it's not always sine theta folks so see here this is line of action of force and this is labor arm We had a very similar clicker question. See, this is very same thing here. This is R, and this is F. It is just like that, okay? We had a clicker question just like that before, okay? Uh, so it picks cosine means it's going to be this one here. So don't think torque is always RF sine theta, okay? It is theta, sine theta, only if theta is right. So for that, see, R is here, F is here. So if this angle or that angle was given, then that would be B, RF sine theta. But since those angles are not there, rather this angle is given, hopefully this sketch did not confuse you. 
See, the angle is one here. This means that is 30 degree, not this one here. Okay. Okay, so that's that. So today, we did not use kinematics, dynamics, or conservation principles. We did not do that. What we did instead is defined a new term. So we learn about vocabulary, but just defining was not enough. We needed to learn how to calculate it so that we can use that in equation, okay? So when there is rotational motion, that means when object is spinning, okay? We need to think in terms of torque. We need to do calculation in terms of torque. But sometimes what happens is spinning object may also be translating. Rotating object may also be translating. For example, obvious example, tire of bicycle or car, right? It's spinning. So the, the motion is rotational, but it is also moving from one place to another place on the road. So going from one place to another place on the road, that's a translational motion. And that's what we've been talking about until today's class, right? Anything with motion we said, that was translational. Now, rotational. So a tire, you know, on the car or bicycle could be rotating and translating at the same time. Similarly, over here, it's not just the tires, but we can have objects, something like this, that could be translating and rotating at the same time. So what happens is the, here what happens, this object is moving from one place to another place. At the same time, also rotating, see, the handle was there, and now over there, uh, coming back down here, so it is kind of one complete rotation you see here, okay? So now what happens is, okay, the translation. So to, to figure out what's the translation, which point we're gonna be following, right, for the object. So what happens is a point called center of mass of the object acts as if it was a point object in terms of translational motion. So understanding center of mass is important. And center of mass and center of gravity is same for the objects. That is, you know, not huge. So even for the buildings, boss, car, center of mass and center of gravity are gonna be same. So unless we have really a ob large object like in a fairy tale, like where you put a, uh, let's say ladder from us to the moon, right? So in that case, what happens? The value of G is different. So because of that, weight of that ladder, if you look at the different section of the ladder, over near the earth, the weight is larger. And near the, you know, in between earth and moon, weight gonna be smaller. And once it gets near the moon, again, it becomes larger because of pull of the gravity becomes stronger near the moon and also near the earth in between, not much. So because of that, what happens is center of mass and center of gravity not gonna be same. But for all practical purpose we do as a human being, center of mass and center of gravity gonna be same. So I'm gonna be using them interchangeably. Okay, although they are not exactly same thing, but for us, they behave similarly. So we may use them interchangeably. Okay, center of mass or center of gravity. What is center of mass? Okay, so how do we find center of mass of an object? Here looks like the center of mass is more towards this heavier head of the hammer. So that's how it works. So center of mass shifts towards the heavier side if the object is non-uniform like this. But if an object is uniform, and by the way, center of mass could be at a point where there is no mass at all. So in this case, for this particular, you know, like let's say position, center of mass could be somewhere here. There is no mass of this figure scatter at all. 
Good example is ring. Remember, ring is a hollow thingy. So its center of mass is at the center where there is no mass. So if we have regularly shaped object with ma uniform mass distribution, like no more mass on one side versus another side, then what happens? Center of mass is exactly at the geometric center. For example, for a scale like this, what happens? I can balance it exactly at the center by just shifting my finger. What happens? Wherever I can balance, it's going to be at the geometric center, which is right at 50 centimeter. I don't know if you can see it. Okay, It is one meter long scale, believe it or not. So you can move your fingers like that and wherever they meet, that's going to be center of mass. Even if it is not a uh, regular, if even if it has a more mass on one side, this technique works. But if mass is uniformly distributed, center of mass is going to be exactly at the center. But there are, can be sometimes object like this. So for that, you can use plumb, plumb line and draw lines at, you know, starting from different point and wherever they intersect, that is the center of mass, okay? So now to keep that in mind and to remind ourselves, here is a question. So here is this. So it was otherwise rectangle, but this side, the mass is missing on this side. So what do you think the center of mass of this object is? Okay. So possible points are shown over there. So which one you think is the closest or best among the given one? So let's close this in 30 more seconds. Five more seconds, five, four, three, two, one, and it stops. Okay, so let's see what we got. So mostly C and that is correct. So B is at the center, but the center of mass is not at the center here because the mass from this side is missing, means there is more mass on this side, means it shifts, it shifts more towards the, the more mass. So that's why C is the better choice, okay? So it looks like it's time, you know, where we end the class. So I'm going to leave it here. If you have question, please stay behind and ask me or else I'll see you next class.